All right, we're on to the next session here. It looks like this is improving the export-import functionality for Rados. Um, this is a blueprint put forth by Danny. Danny, you want to give us an overview of what you're thinking here? Are you muted? Yeah, I can mute it. Here, I think your headset is muted. You're not muted on blue jeans. No? Yep. Yeah. Um, that's not a headset, so. Yeah. Um, this <laughs> is coming from a situation where we tried to export via the uh, Raiders Report Export uh, tool uh, data from a production cluster to another one. And it was only a few uh, terabytes, uh, I guess two or three. and. It was so slow that it uh, would need more than one or two days uh, to export the data down to disk and um, not even thinking about import re-importing. And uh, we hit some uh, problems there. Um, not only that it was uh, very slow, um, it also failed depending on the file system uh, where you try to export it because uh, if you have uh, big files uploaded to via the S3 interface, um, to the cluster uh, on export, they uh, chunks get um, they collect some uh, data and write it down metadata and write it down into the um, extended attributes um, of the files and uh, they reach the maximum size depending on the file system. So that is also a part that is failing completely. Um, and uh, the other problem in general is from my point that it's uh, depending uh, on extended attributes. So uh, if you have a file system not supporting extended attributes, you fail completely. So um, yeah. And um, we could improve the export uh, performance um, by changing the code. Um, um, I have to, don't have the patch around at the moment. Uh, I lost it, so I have to rewrite it. By shuffling the uh, the objects that need to be exported before uh, giving them to the export mm -hmm. threads, so that that improved the performance, I guess, because all, all threads tried usually to read from the same OSD at the same time, so yeah. Yeah. Um, the performance was limited. Um, and uh, but we couldn't uh, improve the import. Uh, that easily, so that is the other side that was still slow to re-import all the data into the new cluster. Huh. Um, and in general, it would be nice to have some way to uh, export from one cluster and re-import to the other cluster without any file system in between. So yeah. So is that is it is it already sort of threaded? Is there always already a thread pool yeah, that's doing it's the export and import? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. But it doesn't doesn't work very well apparently okay yeah. um yeah so i mean okay, for a full-size so pool you'd want to be able to parallelize across machines anyway yeah. right yeah yeah so that, i think they're oh yeah that's true too right you don't want to have it all going through a single process no you don't yeah so i think so there are the, like it needs to be expanded to have some kind of a go ahead sorry um, well okay go ahead I was going to say we need a way to cookieify it so that we can assign sub pieces of the object space to different um, to different processes. And uh, well, obviously we can't be putting all the X headers in the file. That's a different problem, though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think that the the first and most obvious problem is that exporting Rados to a file system is just like fundamentally broken because a Rados object has bytes, it has attributes that don't fit in X adders, and it has OMAP key value data, which doesn't fit in a file or a attribute, like it's neither. So I wonder if we should just get rid of that, right? <laughs> Take that off the table. Um, or, or make a new, maybe rename this as like, call it something else, not export, but like Rados dump to file or something. Yeah, so, um, so I think then then the, the export really should be writing to a stream, similar to what RBD export and RBD diff do, that you can either pipe to a file or you can pipe over the network to another process that's an importing from that same stream. Yeah. 
Um, and that I think will give us much more, much more flexibility for this. So we have uh, other tools using this functionality already, or so, uh, don't they work similarly? Any... Right. So RBD oh, export similar. has its okay. own little byte format, stream format that will stream. Well, I guess export is just a raw, but there's export diff has its own little format. But either way, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's a stream based thing, so you can send it to standard out, standard in, um, which I th think makes sense here. Um, I think while we're at it, we should make sure that the export Redis export should take a snapshot argument, pool snapshot argument, if there is a pool snapshot. Um, the snapshots are, are tricky because there's two kinds of snapshots. So if there are pool snapshots, then do we want to export the pool state as of a particular pool snapshot, or do we want to try to reconstruct the the state of the entire history of the pool in the target cluster. And that, I guess, is sort of a question. I don't know. Do you have a sense of that, Danny? Um, no, uh, no, we didn't think about that because we simply tried to export a, a writer's pool that was filled with S3 and there was no snapshotting at all. So I didn't think about this. Oh. So certainly for self-managed snapshots, um, librbd does. Then I think we do. We would want to reconstruct that history, right? If yeah, you were, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Etherpad is being laggy. The pad working for other people? I'm just disconnected. Yeah. Um, right. And so then that's another case where it's really important that there be like a stream that can encode all this uh, additional metadata, right? Because um, what the snapshots are, what they apply to, um, preserve. And not just the, not just the most recent version. Um, and then and then I think the last thing, which is Sam's point, um, is really important too, and that's the ability to ability to shard the porting process. I guess it's really just the export process. You could have as many import streams as you want, right? Yeah, that's true. Better to try to export. Um, At the Redis level, I think it's just a way of asking. I want um, I want to be able to list between cookie X and cookie Y and give me, I don't know, a 100 cookie per, per partition of the space. Okay. Right. Okay, and that would be that would be basically hash offset. Export in terms. Of yeah, I mean that's what we're getting out. But the Redis interface is something like give me cookies that represent a, you know, a one 100 part partitions of the space. Yeah, yeah. If we assume the objects are well distributed, then that's just easy. So. Yeah. I think I think that realistically, that's as simple as generating um, an even distribution of n values between zero and two to the thirty-two. Yeah, I just don't want the Redos user to do that manually. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, we do have, I think we actually do have a part of the Liberatus API that that does expose a little bit of that. I can't remember. Begin can take a U32 hash position. Yep. So we could just reuse that. As long as um, as long as the iterator tells you what position you're at, so you can tell when to stop when you hit the next offset. So. Yep. Does it already do that? And making sure that well, the cookies are the cookies adjacent. I can't remember. Sorry, what's that? 
I'm trying to remember what what happens to hashes as you iterate through through, uh, through the space. They, yeah, I'm gonna have to verify that that works. I think the way that we use it right now, um, um, isn't it a PG slash hash tuple, or? Uh, no, this you you feed in an arbitrary hash position to begin. <clears throat> and on the iterator, you can ask it what its um, its current a hash offset for its current PG is. So it'll give you a chunky position, and you can feed it an arbitrary input, and it'll sort of get close to that. Just a little bit awkward. I think right now it's just used to randomize the start offset and nothing else. Um, right. So we need to understand the behavior and see if we can get it to do yeah a, a little more a little better. Um, uh, um, okay. And then basically for export, we would just have optional arguments that would you give it a start and end offset, and it would. Go do its thing. I think so. That in parallel across a bunch, sending to the same piece that's ingesting on the other end, or separate ones. Um, I guess we don't need to really need to worry about atomicity. In any case, you're actually running the whole pool, you're just going to stream it. And if you, you have to like write the whole objects carefully or anything like that. Um, so it would be like a optional chunk size, I guess, for the export. Um, if you're streaming it, you just need to make sure that the export is blocking on um, writing the data to whatever the output pipe is. So that it'll throttle itself. Um, okay. And actually, so one other thing was whether we would want a. Um, so we had a, a use case for this actually come up on the, in the context of the file system when we were talking about um, DFS check stuff for CephFS. Um, the the idea being that we might want to back up the metadata pool before you try to do some repair. Um, and since the metadata pool doesn't use any of the snapshot stuff, you could just use a pool-wide snapshot to do that um, as far as taking the snapshot. Um, but also, you probably want the ability to copy it to another pool. Um, and in that case, I think it's, it would be this this one here where it would uh, you would The state of um, export the state of the pool relative to a given pool snapshot. Is it worth making like a CP pool function that would sort of chain the two together in one client, or is it? It probably isn't. It's probably just as easy to do type export pipe import. Yeah, let's do the first thing first. Let's circle back. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, you can't roll. You can't roll back a pull snapshot, can you? No. <clears throat> no, you can't. That might be a useful thing, though. Good. Okay. Okay. Is there is there any way to check if the re-import in another pool or other cluster is the same as the export? So to verify if it worked in any way, um, it's maybe hard, but there is no pool wide checksum. 
make one, something like rados p pool um, fingerprint start end. Like if you give it a range of offsets, it would just like okay. it would generate a checksum by like iterating over the objects in a deterministic order and yeah. make a manifest. Cool. Then you could like in theory you could take two pools and generate the same fingerprint across both of them. Yeah. And the, the stream format I could probably do something similar to what we did with RBD. Um, let me find those docs. Or Ceph Optics Store Tool. Uh, yeah, if yeah. the stream format happened to be identical, then you could Rados import and Ceph Optics Store output PG dump. Yes, that would be awesome. Um, is the I don't I don't know PGX... that it's quite applicable, but it it might be. Hmm? Well, there's I mean one of the things that we talked about was making a an import or a PG dump import that just uses Rados. So this oh, yeah. could we're, be that. We're definitely going to do that. I'm just I'm just not sure if the format's going to be precisely the same. Uh, it it might be once you strip out all the PG specific metadata that isn't relevant for an import anyway. So maybe there's a yeah. there's a way to filter the stream. Actually, that would be the correct thing. You pass it through a filter that took out all of the PG log and PG info stuff and mm -hmm. turn and, you know, object info and turn it into a, uh, yeah, that's actually the right thing. Just the, just the it's even elegant. You just pass the, you pass the SAP object store tool through a filter and the stuff that comes out is the input to, yeah. to this tool, which happens to be the same as Redis export. Or, or import would understand what the, so if, if the, if the format is sort of labeled so that there's like a type and a length for each data chunk or whatever, I mean, it could just like skip That's the ones that it doesn't understand. So it could say yep, skipping did a good job on that. PG log section, skipping, you know, whatever. Yeah. I guess the question is whether David um, from right. Is, is David on? He's not on. Is, is, no, he's um, <laughs> Oh, that's right. Lucky him. Um, is it going to be able to reconstruct all of the same um, object metadata? Not all of it. We don't even want like it to. The user version. Yeah. Oh, Some of no. It, like we, the user that, version, perhaps? If, no, that one we can't. If that's part of the publicly visible thing, that's a thing that it's not currently exporting. And we need to add that to the format. It doesn't do that right, right now. Mm -hmm. I think object version yep. or user version, I'm not sure we can set anyway or no we can't you can't you we can't do it set we set it when we do you only observe it. when we promote when we do promotion oh i mean the, the cache that one we, the osd we can't but it's 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 not rados ex ex exposed is it but the the tiering agent is using um rados right it's using copy from does copy from That's preserve the user version i guess it must Okay. It does. Yeah, you, yes. you must be right. I, I can't remember if I, I can't remember not, if we added a um it's in a set. it's kind of invisible though. You can only set it to whatever the thing was. So we'd have to modify it would have to oh you know what? It would have to be like um write full. No, there no, you'd have to just add an an explicit set user version option. I think there's a get and not a set. I think I can't remember. Yeah. Well the original intention wasn't to be able to set it. Yeah, but then yeah. we need it for copy from. Yeah. So we'll just have to make a list of all the other user exposed metadata that we need to copy. It's like M time, which we can already set. You can set the M time. Oh, okay. On right, it's the user passes the M time on right. <laughs> Basically, it's a. But it's not exposed it's via Rados. It's exposed via stat. You can observe it and you can set it with any right. I guess you could just do a touch and you set the in temp, whatever you want. That'll do it. I think. Okay. Check. Um, okay. So, um, make this compatible. Okay. 
Cool. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't see anything in here that lets you set the user version. Is it objector level and not libretto's level? I think I think it's I think it's you can observe it um, with copy get and copy from sets it locally, but there isn't an explicit set. It, I think that's why. It does, but it's it's you don't control it. You get whatever the copy, you get whatever the user version you're copying from was. Exactly. You're asserting yeah. it with the source version. Okay, so yep. we just we just need yep. to add a set user version. Add a set to yeah. Okay. And in time, we don't need to worry about it. It's going to be there. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I think making this work with the PG export is perfect. Okay. Cool. Is there anything else in the in here? Verification checksums. Yes, direct import export. Yep, you could do. Burritos export. Else? Ten minutes left in the session here. So is have we heard from um Stan Tiar or the, the other one, the RBD one? Might as well cover that too, because I think I think this is an old let me look. The integrity yes, local import thing? It's also an old blueprint. I'm not sure he's here. Um, so let's, let's talk about this at the same time. It's a sort of very similar problem. And probably won't take more than 10 minutes. Um, so the, the, the challenge there is um, the RBD export doesn't have any CRCs, as I understand it. See, have you looked at this one, Danny? How old, how old is this one? It's March. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's from a couple of sessions back. I think we didn't. Did we discuss it the first time around? Maybe we didn't get discussed. I, I think the concern was, at least from when I read the uh, the issue, is that. You, when you are importing something, you don't know if it's going to properly and cleanly apply to what your current state of the image is. For the, oh, I see. Oh, you don't know if it's the right source image. Yeah, because I, I can apply a patch on top of anything, basically. OK. Um, do we have an ID on RB that would be appropriate there? Not really directly. Um, I think we we talked about this before. I can't remember exactly what we uh, thought about it before, but um, I think we thought about maybe make a, gathering some kind of checksum of the image, not not of not, not reading all the data, but perhaps for reading certain offsets of it, or at certain percentages of disk size or something like that, and and storing that along with the diff. So then you could, could uh, compute that checksum when you're doing an import, um, and make sure that it matches what the import says it should ma should be. So like a fast fingerprint type of thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's also just like, do we have like a UUID in the image header that just sort of identifies that? We do, but it's not it's not really settable um, when you're creating your images right now. Okay. It's it's just uh, automatically generated for you. Okay.
we want to do like maybe maybe you want to apply this to multiple images in the same pool or something even. So in that case, we wouldn't want to use the same IDs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I think the fingerprinting idea wouldn't be that, that difficult um, to implement and would still be pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah, you just do like NIOs. <laughs> exactly. Like 50 or something, however many you decide. Um. And with the map stuff, we can even make sure that it's actually on extents that have data. <laughs> y yeah, although you'd want it to be deterministic even if object map isn't there, so. Yeah. But it's just, it would just be a property of like the stream format, right? So it could encode, it could say, we've checked some like these offsets. Oh yeah, that's true. From them. that's true, yeah. That's true, okay. And then we could CRC each block within the, in the diff. Yeah. And... Um, okay, so wait, so, all right, so there's, we need a fingerprint function, which would, um, or CRCs for random embedded in the stream, right? Yeah. So basically just generate a blob that would go in the stream. And then there'd be a verify fingerprint. Take that as an input. Mm -hmm. Then we could add these to the CLI too. So you could just generate a fingerprint and put it in a file and then check it on the other end. Yeah. And we could probably have an option to skip the verification on import in case you get um, partially through importing something. And the fingerprint happens to include those blocks that you just overwrote. Oops. Embed. And export at start of diff. <clears throat> when would wait you'd only use the skipping if you had a corrupt image and you wanted to continue anyway right well um either, either that or if you um like it had gotten part way through importing a diff before and then it crashed and you want to uh, finish up the import. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Um, that's easy. And I guess another idea in general was just storing a CRC of the actual um, exported diff itself so that you can be sure that you're importing something that's valid. Yeah, or to each, each data block even, like you said. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what's the, the last thing? It, and extend the RBD command to support importing diff over to a local file. Oh, it doesn't do it. It won't. It doesn't do it on a raw file. Right, right. It's just only adding to a new image. Actually, only existing images. Um, which is another, another thing we could fix by the RBD diff import is uh, making it actually create the image instead of only applying it to an existing one.
Doesn't it? Can't you do a diff import um, starting from the beginning? It doesn't create. Doesn't create though. Still. So. Okay. Okay, that's all pretty straightforward. Transfer dead tickets. Um, so how much of this do we actually want to do <laughs> for Hammer? Um, that's a good question. I think for Hammer, there's lots of other things that are going on already that might take up most of our time. Yeah. But it's certainly something to good to think about for the future, and mm -hmm. or just small random tasks that would be more isolated and could be picked up by Anyone with interest? Yep. Yeah, this would be a good thing for the proverbial chum bucket. Yep. Or, um, one of Louis' workshops. Is cool. that good at okay. all? All done for the double whammy session there? Knock two so, out at the same time. Yeah, well, that one was for. Yeah, we're gonna be so far ahead. We're gonna be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, we can take one, a... we can one. One thing I, one thing I don't see in the pet currently is there any way to verify that it's the correct uh, RBD or. Ah uh, yes, was, so uh, that's in the blueprint. Right. Yeah. So the the fingerprint would is the idea is that the fingerprint would do that. Um, we could also like assert. I think it already does that though, actually. I mean, the problem is that we don't have like an identifier that's in the image that tells you which image it is. I mean, there's like, there's a name, but like, who knows what the name is? It could be arbitrary. It doesn't have to be the same thing. Whereas the fingerprint would just sort of give you a probabilistic fingerprint of the content that would give you some assurance that's the right one. Okay, so there's currently no UID or something like that for an RBD. No. Well, would it make well, there, sense there to is, but it's... There is, but um, it's internal and not really uh, controlled by um, users when they're creating new images. We we could set a, a property that's like um, mirrored from equals whatever the source of UID is. And the first time you do a diff, it'll set that, and then subsequently it'll verify it's the same one. So if you suddenly start importing from somewhere else, it'll get confused. Yeah, we could do, do, do something like that. Just add another property that uh, only diff would set. Um, that, might, that would make sense. As long as all the images that you're importing on top of were created with this by importing a diff. Yeah, or it could it could set it when it, the first time you do an import diff, if it's cleared, it'll set it, and subsequently it'll verify it's the same. At least sort of that that way it could sort of phased in. Yeah, I guess it could assert that it like the image is empty, um, hmm. and then set it, and then check it later. That would work. Weird, I keep getting disconnected from the pad. It's a long time to reload. Yeah, okay. Um, is that wrapping that up? Looks yeah, like Mike okay. is here, so we can proceed to the next one apace. All right. Yeah, okay.